everyone, uh, welcome to this um, session of the uh, final conference of the New Horizon project. My name is uh, Vincent Block, and I am one of the work package leaders uh, involved in this project. And I'm very happy that I am able to um, uh, moderate this session. And uh, the the key issue or the key uh, topic of this session is um, uh, the the implementation of responsible research and innovation in uh, Horizon 2020. Uh, the, the policy challenges that uh, that came with the implementation of responsible innovation and by the end of the framework program of Horizon 2020, also the lessons learned. Uh, and this is important because we are entering now a new phase of Horizon Europe and these lessons learned can also help us to make new strategies or new ideas for future developments. I'm very happy that uh, Lyndon Ferrer can can uh, will will um, join us uh, join us today to uh, to provide his insights in in these type of developments. Um, Lyndon is policy officer at the DG Research and Innovation Open Science Unit, and he has been involved for several years in the mainstreaming of responsible research and innovation across. Horizon 2020 and is one of the uh, people with the, from the policy perspective with the great insights in this development. Now I assume that we will gather around 60, 70, 80 people around during this meeting. And I saw already, uh, and that's the nice part of having these type of conferences, uh, great intellectual friends uh, from this project. Uh, I saw people from um, uh, my own social lab, Inika Malsh, for instance, I saw people from other responsible research and innovation projects. So I, I assume that we have collected uh, a community of people that are interested in research and innovation and responsible research and innovation. We start with the presentation by Linden. Um, this will take around 30, 40 minutes. And then we have again 30 to 40 minutes to to engage in a discussion with him, but also with each other, to draw the lessons from the uh, from the responsible innovation implementation in Horizon 2020, and to uh, to explore together also strategies how to move this agenda forward. Um, for those, uh, I, I assume that everybody knows how Zoom is working. I will not explain the facilities uh, uh, at large, but but uh, it is important to look at the bottom of your screen because there we have a chat function uh, and if you put uh, push on the chat you can also already during the presentation of linden you can already raise questions um, make remarks say hello to your friends that everything that you like you can do um, we will have keep an eye a little bit on the chat so that we also collect already already a little bit the type of questions that you might have and, and, and engage in the discussion with Linden afterwards. Um, and of course, also uh, after the presentation, you can also raise your questions uh, directly. So um, Linden, thank you again for, for joining us and for the, your willingness to uh, present your insights from the policy perspective. Um, the floor is yours. Mm, thank you, Vincent. And uh, let me first say that it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with you uh, to present this keynote uh, on responsible research and innovation. I also see a lot of uh, very familiar names uh, in the participants, so great to see you all here. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully um, you can see this presentation. Um, so as Vincent explained, I've been uh, I've been at DG Research and Innovation um, and following responsible research and innovation since 2016. I was in the sector called mainstreaming RRI in, in Horizon 2020 um, as part of the Science Within Four Society unit, uh, which of course um, became uh, part of a different unit. I was also part of the interim evaluation, uh, which I think uh, brought quite a 
it brought eventually quite a change to the to the way that uh, the work program uh, oriented itself so we worked a lot with uh, experts uh, on that as well and for the last few years i've been trying to bring the insights from from the portfolio of projects and the efforts across uh, horizon 2020 uh, into uh, the horizon europe uh, program um, but before doing that we go back to 2016 perhaps and this is the topic uh, which led to uh, New Horizon. It was called Moving from Constraints to Openings, from Red Lines to New Frames in Horizon 2020. Um, a slightly cryptic uh, topic title in line with, with many of the others from this particular work program. Um, but basically it was asking to do something very challenging and that was uh, to try and uh, build communities and build awareness and to do the job that we try to do at the Commission as well, which is to mainstream responsible research and innovation across all the different parts uh, of the program. Now, uh, this had a budget of 6 million euros uh, associated with it uh, in the 2016 to 2017 work program. Uh, this is one of the largest projects uh, supported from this program. Uh, and I can tell you that it did raise some eyebrows uh, with the member states uh, who questioned whether this was not too much for one particular project. Um, but I think it was, it was well founded uh, to, to allocate a large budget because it's a really uh, challenging undertaking to, to put in place uh, a mechanism, and this was the social labs uh, which you put in place, uh, to try and do things and interact with different actors uh, who are associated with different parts of the Horizon 2020 program. Um, and then put in place all of these pilots uh, that I've been reading about and I guess we'll hear about over the next few days. Uh, and do other important work such as the societal readiness tool, uh, the policy briefs uh, that have come through uh, our mailboxes every now and again. So there's been a lot of work to do and of course there's this uncertainty uh, about responsible research and innovation which um, caused a bit of consternation I'm sure, not least to this project. Um, and of course uh, I think I was, part, I was also a bit concerned uh, when the first uh, developments for Horizon Europe started to take shape because it looked like responsible research and innovation uh, was was not being uh, focused on so much, uh, but actually through negotiation with the member states in the European Parliament and hopefully through reflection uh, and debate in the Commission as well, I think we've ended up with uh, a programme moving forwards, um, which is quite hopeful. Um, and that's what I'm going to try and go through uh, in this uh, keynote. So I split the presentation up into three parts because it's uh, quite a long presentation. The first is a very, very basic uh, overview of what we mean by responsible research and innovation at the European Commission. I'm not going into all of the, uh, into all of the theoretical and philosophical aspects of this. Uh, many of them in the room know all of this far better than me, but we yeah, really need to provide this as, as some kind of context. Then I move on to the main part, which is on mainstreaming responsible research and innovation in Horizon 2020. Um, and again, this isn't a very sophisticated uh, analysis of what we've done, but I think it's some angles that we can take to, to try and work out how we've done. Um, and I, I think the story I'll tell is that starting from a very low point, uh, things have been building up. Uh, and then I move on to the final part, operationalizing RRI and Horizon Europe. And you'll notice there's a difference there between mainstreaming and operationalizing. Uh, if I were to be totally accurate, I guess I would say mainstreaming and operationalizing RRI and Horizon Europe. And that's going to explain uh, what it is that we're trying to do differently in the, in the framework program that's just about to begin um, compared to Horizon 2020 and hopefully building from the experiences in Horizon 2020. So to go back even further than 2016, and really more than a decade than that, uh, we go to the emergence of responsible research and innovation. Um, this built on, on previous concepts, uh, technology assessments and things like this. Uh, why was this? Well, because it had been societal rejection of technological developments. Uh, we know about the BSC scandal, GM crops, there were issues around smart meters and homes and things like this. Um, in addition, there were the impacts uh, of technology were clearly difficult to predict and uh, you know maybe some impacts are impossible to predict but it's important to at least try to predict the predictable so uh, there was an argument that early societal intervention would help anticipate impacts and increase societal acceptance now uh, if we look at the policy background this concept doesn't come out of nowhere uh, from FP5 onwards, uh, you can find some traces in FP4, but it's FP5 onwards, uh, you see an increasing societal focus in the framework programs. Before this, there was a lot of ICT and, and uh, much more focused technological development. It became more social after this. 
Uh, and then in FP6, we had the Science and Society, and the FP7, we had the Science in Society programs. And uh, there was a lot of research and pilot projects uh, on the ethics and governance of new technologies and public engagement. Uh, so in Horizon 2020, um, Responsible Research and Innovation was kind of launched with the aim to encourage societal actors to work together during the whole research and innovation process and to better align RNI and its outcomes with the values, needs and expectations of society. But what does that mean uh, in essence? Uh, it's trying to bring different actors uh, into the process of developing research and innovation to produce better outcomes. Now, the European Commission then uh, outlined key dimensions that it thought were uh, essential part of this, uh, public engagement, open access and data, uh, gender equality, science education, ethics, and a particular emphasis on governance. Um, and what I'll say is that these key dimensions uh, put the focus on very practical areas um, that uh, can help work towards responsibility. Um, they focus on the processes uh, of conducting the research of innovation out of which more responsible outcomes are expected. It's not looking at the outcomes. Uh, and in addition, it's applicable in principle to all areas of research and innovation, which is quite important from very uh, applied areas where we can imagine uh, this is important, but also uh, to more fundamental parts or the humanities and, and things like this as well. Responsibility is something that cuts across. I know that uh, there's been a lot of debate uh, on this. My understanding, my, uh, my approach to the key dimensions is that they provide a practical path towards which you can work towards responsibility, but it's not responsibility per se. Uh, there's more to it than that, of course. And uh, you know, you could say that this is not really the original concept that was put forward. It's, it's something uh, that's maybe uh, more practical. I guess that is the case. Um, but uh, there are some there are some advantages to taking this approach as well. And I think if you take any of these dimensions away from responsibility, you, you have a hard time explaining yourself. You can't really have responsibility while ignoring gender equality or public engagement or, or the open science, open access and things like that. So in principle, this was applied across uh, Horizon 2020. Um, and there was a part of the programme, Science Within for Society, which was, received a, a relatively small budget, but it's still not inconsequential with close to 500 million, uh, called Science Within for Society, which focused very, very much uh, on uh, the different dimensions of RRI, uh, but also RRI itself, and became really a sort of hub uh, for learning and building networks uh, and things like that. So now we move on to uh, the mainstreaming in Horizon 2020. Uh, how do we assess this? It's very difficult uh, to approach uh, in one particular way. Now, one way would be uh, to look at RI in the regulation in the specific program. Of course, there's a limitation here. There's operationalization, uh, how it's put into practice. We could look at the work programs. Um, for instance, we could look at keywords. Um, we could just look at the keywords for RRI, or we could look at the keywords for the dimensions. Uh, you can get particularly, uh, you, can, you can go into quite a lot of detail in the different ways that this can be done. Of course, the limitation is keywords are imperfect, uh, and they don't mean they don't mean that something will be taken up in the proposals and the funded projects, because that requires actually something to be in the regulation in a specific program and operationalized. Um, just for context, I mean, we, we do a, a keyword search on citizen science, and even with 80 different sets of keywords, we still miss some projects, uh, from the abstracts at least, uh, which, which should be included in this list. So it's very difficult to do uh, keyword analysis and, and really take it uh, as the final, uh, the final picture of what's going on. But nevertheless, it does give an important picture. Then we could look at, at the sort of the outputs uh, or even outcomes of the work programs, and that is projects um, that have been selected through the evaluation process and which have been identified as taking an RRI approach. Uh, the limitations here actually are more to do with the implementation of the monitoring mechanisms um, because there are very broad and divergent understandings of RRI, uh, and the monitoring is based on the promise at uh, the grant preparation stage rather than the actual car activities carried out. Nevertheless, uh, the projects uh, that have been identified as taking this approach do tell us something uh, important about how well we've mainstreamed. Finally, we could talk about the impact of projects. Um, I would say that this is too early, uh, especially across the programme as a whole. There's many projects still running uh, and some still to begin from the, uh, the Green Deal call, I believe. Um, but the Science Within for Society part provides an indication, particularly 
uh, as regards institutional changes and I would say the developments in Horizon Europe are a reflection uh, of some of the messages coming out of these projects. So if we look at the, um, the program, the regulation and the specific program, I'm not sure you can see the words properly, but something's blocking it. Um, in the regulation, uh, we have a recital on the importance of science society relations. It's sort of a background statement. It doesn't really carry too much uh, emphasis overall, but it's, uh, it's an important statement nonetheless. Uh, there's an article 12 on external advice and societal engagement, but that's really about strategic planning. That's, uh, that's the step before uh, the development of the work program, so to speak, about consultations with stakeholders and things like this. We have article 14, which is about the cross-cutting issues. Uh, in the regulation, it's called RRI, including gender, but of course, uh, we generally uh, treat RRI and gender as separate cross-cutting issues. In the specific program, there's emphasis in the science within for society part, uh, and there's an annex three, uh, which is about monitoring, monitoring the cross-cutting issues. Uh, but something that struck me as I was as I was sort of looking at these different mentions of RRI and related keywords in Horizon 2020 legal text is is this really adequate? Uh, it's it's almost as if it's been parachuted in. Um, it's it's standalone. It says do something. Uh, and it's important that we that we promote RRI and other cross-cutting issues. But when you look at the different cross-cutting issues, there's 14 of them, uh, and not all of them are promoted in the same way. RRI is one of those that has been promoted consistently. Uh, but some, for instance, uh, I think like cost or widening, well, they are either uh, program parts in themselves or they're actual sort of uh, separate mechanisms uh, for funding. So uh, this is a sort of uh, sort of limited starting point, and I think this. This uh, feeds into uh, and influences what we see further down the line as well. So we can look at the work programs. I know that New Horizons has done much more uh, in-depth keyword analysis of the different program parts like this. But if we just look for responsible research and innovation in full uh, and abbreviation, uh, and we look at the different work programs, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018, 2020, uh, we can get a feeling uh, for how uh, well this has been mainstreamed because if it's in a work program it's much more likely to be addressed in the projects either directly or in a kind of indirect manner because it's influencing their activities um, so in 2014-2015 we find just 10 mentions of RRI in work programs and this is really not very much uh, of which four of them are in the topics because we could argue that if it's mentioned in a topic it's much more likely to become an integral part uh, of the projects, uh, the proposals and the projects that get selected. Uh, but we only find four, four topics, 2014, 2015, uh, where RI is specifically mentioned. 2016, 2017, you see a huge increase there uh, from 10 to 36 and double the number of topics mentioning RI, still a very low number of topics. Uh, I think you can see here some efforts going on uh, within the commission and, and outside the commission as well to try and update this. But of course, when 20, you know, the work program 2016, 2017, was quite early on uh, in the day as well. But when we get to 2018, 2020, um, and this includes the Green Deal call, uh, so it's the latest update, uh, you find 42 mentions, which is, well, I mean, it's just a number, but it's, it's compared to tennis, a lot more, and you get a feeling across the work programs, this is fairly consistent now. And there's 22 topics that mention RRI. Now, actually, on as regards to the topics, I think the argument is sound that if you mention RRI in a topic, it's more likely to be addressed and picked up. Uh, but we we have start to have some evidence that this isn't necessarily um, essential and not always the case. So then we can move on to the projects identified as taking an RRI approach, uh, monitoring RRI in Horizon 2020. Now we have a key performance indicator for this, uh, as you do, uh, because we need to measure how we're doing, uh, and this is citizens civil society organizations and other societal actors contributing to the co-creation of scientific agendas and scientific contents. Now, if you try and unpack this, this is extremely broad. Um, it can include uh, projects that don't have any citizens or civil society organizations, but are taking a multi-stakeholder approach. I mean, that's fine as well, but it's, uh, it's one, one way of doing uh, another. Uh, it could be including projects that are all about citizen science. And it can include projects where actually um, there's a lot more focus on sort of downstream uh, engagement to the point of it being outreach almost. Uh, and the assessment is made uh, for this KPI at grant preparation stage. So this is the proposals 
uh, that have been selected and are going through grant preparation. And, but because this KPI doesn't translate directly uh, into something very tangible for the project officers who have a lot of work to do um, on a lot of grants that they have to sign, uh, the proxy question was projects that engage the public. Now, when we look at the projects, the first thing I'll say is that this was very often interpreted, I think, uh, as uh, the softer or uh, more outreach uh, aspects, but not always. Uh, so we, co we cover with this KPI a very broad range of activities, but on the other hand, we capture very broadly and imperfectly the concept. And in real time, I think it's, uh, it's updated daily. So we can see here a uh, graph showing uh, the percentage of the projects that are flagged as taking an RI approach by the program part. Uh, and you can see that actually you find projects uh, across most of the program. Um, there's some parts that have less than others. ERC, I would say, uh, does have a lower level of public engagement in its project for obvious reasons, but there's also data issues there. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not really reported uh, correctly. But you can find across the societal challenges uh, and in SWAFs, a uh, very high level uh, of the projects, proportion of the projects that have been flagged as taking this RI approach. Uh, you could say, why are SWAFs at 70% and not 100? Well, that's because we have projects in SWAFs uh, that are, for instance, uh, implementing gender equality plans that don't involve engaging the public. Uh, and you could say, uh, is this high enough in all of the different parts of the programme? Um, I think in some cases, probably it is. It is high enough. In other cases, it clearly seems very low. Um, there's obviously a question, of course, about the quality of the engagement. Um, is this all about the outreach further on down the line, uh, or is this about co-creation, uh, more fundamentally sort of upstream? So we have 3,000 projects, more than 3,000 projects, receiving more than 11 billion euros of EU support uh, that have been identified as taking this approach, and about 11.4% uh, of projects. Now this graph shows um, some different points over time, they're not equally spaced, uh, but it shows that over time, in general, the picture has remained stable, um, but that over time, equally, uh, there's been a increase um, from about 9% um, in 2018 to 11.4 now. And of course, there's some changes in some of the parts. Sometimes it's more exaggerated than others, depending on how many projects have got. Uh, but in most of the programme and overall, uh, there is an increase. And I think this also reflects a little bit the move towards Horizon Europe, uh, the increased emphasis uh, in the work programmes. Now, I can't see the own, my own title here, but some projects um, that you find outside of Science Within for Society um, are focused specifically on responsible research and innovation. Uh, this is not, uh, again, a particularly robust way of doing this, but if you look at the projects that have abstracts that mention responsible research and innovation in full, so not uh, the acronym, um, you can find projects in all parts uh, of the programme, in fact, and you can see here some of the uh, some of the logos. New Horizon it was funded by SWAFs, but I, I leave it here because really it was uh, connecting the dots and, and working with communities uh, that almost certainly interacted with many of these projects uh, that you find here. So when we think about these 28 projects that happen to mention responsible research and innovation in the abstract, and therefore you could consider that they take a particularly RRI uh, applicable approach, you wonder, well, do they come from topics that mentioned responsible research and innovation and actually only seven of them do uh, so you could draw two conclusions one is that it's not important to mention them mention RI in the topics I don't believe that's the case but what, the conclusion I prefer to draw uh, is that RI has started to become um, a self-standing concept that's being recognized um, by expert evaluators uh, pretty much across uh, all parts of Horizon 2020 uh, and this, uh, this 28 excludes ERC, uh, MSCA and SWAPS projects. But I think that this is uh, quite encouraging in itself. So I move on to the science within for society part uh, of the programme. Uh, there were three objectives, to build effective cooperation between science and society, to foster the recruitment of new talent for science, and to pair scientific excellence with social awareness and responsibility. And you can imagine those three objectives uh, interlink quite a lot. There was a key performance indicator for this part of the programme, and I should mention every part of Horizon 2020 had one key performance indicator. And maybe they had some others, but they weren't the key one. Um, we'll move on to whether this was a good way of doing things. Uh, but for SWAFs, it was the number of institutional change actions 
uh, towards responsible research and innovation. And I think this is a wise choice for a key performance indicator uh, because it outlined at a very early stage in the program uh, just how important uh, the institutional changes are towards building impact. It's not the only way you can get impact out of science within poor society projects, far from it. There's lots of other ways too, but it is one of uh, the key ways that we can do this on a sustainable basis, uh, as in it lasts beyond the lifetime of the project funding. And we had a target for this. I remember setting this target uh, with colleagues. Uh, it was 100 uh, institutional changes in the stakeholder organisations by then of Horizon 2020. Um, of course, we tried to balance whether this is too ambitious, not ambitious enough. It was a good round figure there. Um, but I think when we when we look at the figures, you'll see that this was an underestimation about uh, of really the, the number of different kinds of changes that we can expect to see uh, funded just from SWOFs. So we built up some key uh, portfolios of RRI projects uh, over the last several years. Uh, of course, this doesn't include projects that are focused only or specifically on gender or open access and open data or science education. There's, there's all of these portfolios of projects too. But these are the ones that are taking a sort of RRI approach with this kind of, uh, with the dimensions in the background, let's say. Now, so you can find a portfolio of projects, 21 of them receiving 53 million euros, uh, which are essentially doing co-design or co-creation. Uh, they're developing uh, research agenda, they're working on frugal innovations, they're working on uh, co-creation such as citizen science. So they're doing science and innovation uh, with stakeholders and systems. And then we have a smaller, um, portfolio of projects which is focused on institutional changes, opening up institutions to society, um, but all of them focused on on this institutional change key performance indicator really, well that's how we measure it, but uh, finding in this program I'd say it's really piloting and exploring how we can do this and there's 15 projects uh, receiving 34 million euros. Then there's a smaller portfolio yet on territorial governance, opening up ecosystems at the territorial level uh, to society and often uh, developing smart specialization plans which are in line uh, with the expectations and needs uh, of society. So very interesting projects there too and sometimes this also involves institutional changes. <clears throat> so we have four projects uh, connecting the dots between these portfolios within SWAPS, uh, EU Citizen Science for the Citizen Science and Co-Creation Project, CS Track which is doing research on citizen science, it's the only project that we've uh, funded to do that specifically. We've got RRING, uh, which has been making links between uh, responsible research and innovation in Europe and approaches elsewhere in the world and working with UNESCO uh, and really uh, finding what we can uh, bring to other parts of the world and what we can learn from other parts of the world and, and finding really that you, RRI needs to be contextualized very much uh, in all the different parts of the world uh, and taken up uh, as something that belongs to different communities. And then we find uh, Super Mori, um, which is about developing a monitoring system um, for uh, the evolution and benefits of responsible research and innovation. And it's been uh, building up uh, an ecosystem of, of projects that are looking at uh, impacts and benefits and things like that. Uh, New Horizon isn't here because actually it's working on a much uh, broader level. It's working on across Horizon 2020 um, as a whole. Now, to go back to institutional changes, what do we mean by institutional change? Um, well, a lot of thinking has gone on after the KPI was decided, I must say, um, but we say that it's a change to how a beneficiary governs or structures itself. It's expected to have meaningful impact within the institution concerned, and it's intended to last beyond the lifetime of project funding. So it's not one-off activities, however important they are in different ways, uh, it's, it has to be all three of these things. And what do we mean by an IRI institutional change? It has to relate broadly, we're not too strict on this, I don't think, to the different dimensions, uh, one of the five dimensions, all can manifest as an IRI package <clears throat> if it covers um, more than one or all of them. Now, some examples of institutional changes. Uh, this is from a previous uh, exercise, uh, and you can find the publication below. Um, and uh, in ethics, an institutional change could be uh, the introduction of a new code of ethics. Uh, in gender equality, it could be um, introducing training on implicit bias. In open access, it could be making data, data management plans compulsory. Public engagement, it could be a spin-off company 
uh, to link researchers with industry or recruiting a citizen science facilitator within the institution. In science education, it could be uh, introducing PhD training on communication, for instance, uh, and the full RRI package uh, could be a new information center or a new sort of digital infrastructure or even an RRI policy development plan. Uh, now we've recently repeated um, the exercise of, of, find, of finding out how many institutional changes have been implemented in SWOFs uh, and I think we can update these examples uh, based on that and uh, we should have data uh, in the coming months. So from the previous exercise, 2019 I believe it was, uh, you can see here the number of institutional changes by dimension, uh, many on gender equality, um, 43 on the full RI package, um, and you can see the other numbers there, but you know we've already well and truly exceeded the hundred, uh, and I think we can expect to, to exceed this uh, by several factors uh, again, um, with uh, the the interim uh, exercise that we've done recently, uh, and of course this exercise will have to be repeated uh, again once all of the projects are finished, which we're, you know we're talking about 2024, 2025. But anyway, there's more information there, and I think uh, the institutional changes is something we take forward into Horizon Europe. So moving on to Horizon Europe um, as the final part of this uh, keynote, uh, you'll be familiar with the structure. Uh, the pillar, first pillar essentially the same. The second pillar brings together the industrial parts and the societal challenge parts. And the third part has got a European Innovation Council, which is uh, to some extent a counterpart to uh, the European Research Council. Uh, you'll notice that Science Within Four Society or a Science Society part of the programme is not uh, within this structure, uh, but many of the uh, action points or areas uh, that SWAF's focused on uh, can be found in the reforming and enhancing the European RNI system. In fact, seven out of the eight um, points, which don't correspond exactly, but they're close enough from SWAF's, you can find uh, in the reforming and enhancing the European RNI system part. Something that's not mentioned in the structure is the missions, and that's because they haven't been decided uh, yet whether to go ahead. Of course, we hope that they do. Um, what is a mission? A mission is a portfolio of actions intended to achieve a bold and inspirational as well as a measurable goal within a set time frame. Uh, and the idea is to get portfolios of different kinds of actions from uh, fundamental science, from, from work on governance to uh, public engagement actions to science communication and outreach actions, all working together with different forms of funding to try and solve a challenge. Uh, and these challenges are the emissions uh, on cancer, uh, on climate resilient Europe, uh, on restoring oceans and waters, things like this. Now, if you look <clears throat> at the reports prepared by Mariana Mazzucato, uh, you'll probably get the impression that emissions uh, has quite a lot in common uh, with RRI, in that RRI and the RRI can really bring something to these missions. Uh, and when you look at the governing missions um, publication, you can see that here in particular, the emphasis is really placed uh, on bringing different kinds of actors, civil society and citizens together to try and uh, contribute to solving these missions. And uh, the engagement is seen in terms of co-design, uh, in terms of working out well within the cancer mission how much effort uh, needs to go into prevention how much is on environmental risks how much is on treatment how much is on um, on health literacy things like this um, then the engagement is around uh, the uh, implementation uh, it could be user-led innovation citizen science multi-stakeholder kind of collaborations and then the third area of engagement is co-assessment which is more of sort of iterative or uh, continuous feedback on uh, the portfolios uh, of actions um, and how they're uh, doing. Now if we move to the legal texts, uh, the, the regulation and the specific program, you'll find that there's a recital on science society uh, which mentions RI. You'll find that there's um, a program principle around promoting co-creation and co-design through the engagements of citizens and civil society. Uh, you'll find an operational objective uh, in the specific program on promoting responsible research, taking into account the precautionary principle, uh, which is uh, somehow making links with, uh, with, with the sort of policy links that existed many years ago. Uh, and another one on improving the relationship and interaction between science and society, again, mentioning co-design and co-creation. 
Uh, and in the regulation, you'll find a definition of open science, <coughs> which uh, means an approach to the scientific process based on open cooperative work. And this actually provides a vehicle um, for uh, really focusing uh, on how we can bring responsible research and innovation uh, into action across uh, the programme as a whole. Of course, open science and RI are not exactly the same, but they do hold quite a lot uh, in common. And uh, I think this is an opportunity here for RRI. Um, so open science becomes the modus operandi of the programme uh, and open science practices such as citizen and societal engagement will be operationalised throughout the programme. That's in the award criteria, uh, the key impact pathway indicators and the topic text. So if we look at the Horizon Europe uh, proposal evaluation, we have the excellence criterion. And this applies to all the parts of the program except the ERC, uh, which has a slightly different approach to excellence. Um, and this states the soundness of the proposed methodology, including the engagement of citizens, civil society and end users where appropriate. Now, bearing in mind, uh, we can expect, I don't know, around 300,000 proposals in Horizon Europe. Um, anything that goes in the proposal form and is evaluated um, has a pretty large leverage effect. Um, so in the methodology, it says describe how appropriate open science practices are implemented as an integral part of the proposed methodology. Show how the choice of practices and their implementation are adapted to the nature of the work in a way that will increase the chances of the project delivering on the objectives. So it's expected to be integral and it's expected to be uh, there to deliver on the objectives. It's not an add-on. Uh, that's something I think the expert evaluators would be able to see through that very clearly. Uh, if um, an applicant believes that none of the practices are appropriate for the project, then provide a justification. Now, I think you know a lot of a lot of uh, applicants are going to be coming to this and thinking, ah, it is appropriate. How are we going to do this? Uh, and they're going to be needing to to reach out uh, to bodies of knowledge, uh, to networks, to organisations. Uh, that know how to do this, they've practiced it, uh, they've been funded to do it uh, before. Now, learning from Horizon 2020, uh, in the form, it also says, this question does not refer to outre outreach actions that may be planned as part of communication, dissemination and exploitation activities. <clears throat> Those aspects should be described under impact. Of course, communication is essential, you know, and dissemination, exploitation, also essential, but what's equally essential is that it's not conflated with the methodology and the co-creation uh, and co-design aspects of the that may be brought into uh, the projects. Uh, so here we make a clear explanation, uh, clear, we give clear instructions about how to treat this uh, and I think this is this applies across the program regardless uh, of uh, mentions of responsible research and innovation, any other kind of keyword you can think of this is going to apply and uh, I think this is uh, something to, to keep an eye on because I think it will have an effect on the projects uh, that get selected and also the proposals that get put, that get put forward. Now of course we have to provide some guidance um, for every framework program but particularly I guess where there's a, a change uh, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you could call it extracts of the program guide which will be published shortly uh, but just to give an example of what we would expect uh, in terms of co-design activities uh, we suggest uh, these could be workshops, focus groups, or other means to develop RNI agendas, roadmaps, and policies, often including deep discussion on the implications, the ethics, the benefits, and the challenges related to RNI courses of action or technology development. In terms of co creation, um, we suggest that this, this means involving citizens and end users directly in the development of new knowledge and innovation, uh, for instance, through citizen science and user led innovation. And in terms of co-assessment, as I said, it's an iterative and a continual basis uh, of reflection on policies, programs, uh, portfolios of projects and things like this. We also provide in the program guide uh, some uh, references to existing tools uh, that can help applicants um, improve how they approach these issues. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we've done is to make sure that the, uh, the uh, societal readiness tool uh, is mentioned there amongst some other tools as well because this is a good place to inform applicants uh, that they should have a look at this. So the key impact pathways, um, this is a really a step up on what came in Horizon 2020. In Horizon 2020 we had some key performance indicators, um, they weren't really linked to any impact pathways, so there were one per, uh, one per program part which wasn't comparable 
Um, instead, we move to the key impact pathways. There's three domains of impact, uh, scientific, societal, and economic. Um, there's one, uh, number three is interesting because it's around uh, open data sets and open collaborations and things like this. But if we look at impact pathway six, uh, it's called strengthening the uptake of innovation in society. Now this key impact pathway is constructed with three indicators. There's a short term one, which is during the project, you could say, a medium term one, which is about three years after the project, but maybe at the end of the project too. Uh, and then there's a long term one, which is really up to, set up to 10 years after the project. So starting with the short term one on the left, co-creation, the number and share of projects where citizens and end users contribute to the co-creation of RNI content. So this is quite a strong statement saying that we expect to create a pathway of impact through co-creation. <clears throat> now, if this sounds a bit like Horizon 2020's RRI monitoring, uh, then you would be correct. It's, uh, of course, it's, but it's constructed based on the learning of this, but it's more tightly focused. Uh, I think uh, we try and do away with, uh, with a very, very broad approach, uh, capturing the essence of something, but try to focus a bit more on the co-creation now. Uh, it will be based on actual activities uh, because project coordinators uh, will, who do the periodic reporting uh, will have to tick some boxes. I'm sorry about that, but we have to try and, uh, unfortunately, we have to see how effective we're being. And of course, we can learn uh, from this kind of reporting activity as well. And it differentiates between different types uh, of engagement. And this is based, of course, on what we've seen in Horizon 2020. So we have a, hopefully a better constructed short term indicator than we had before on IRI. Then we've got the medium term indicator, and this is the number and share of beneficiary entities with end user engagement, citizen and end user engagement mechanisms after the project. Now, if this sounds a bit like the SWAPS KPI, uh, then again, uh, you'd be correct because it is very much SWAPS KPI uh, mainstreamed to the program as a whole, uh, but more tightly focused uh, and differentiating uh, by the type of mechanism within this uh, engagement mechanism and of course this uh, the input for this comes from science within poor society and the institutional change projects the argument being that there would be such a demand for co-creation in the projects that in many institutions uh, they will start implementing uh, more uh, permanent mechanisms of various different kinds you know we're very broad on what this could be um, to try and do this uh, more efficiently and effectively now, the long term indicator is societal RNI uptake, um, uptake and outreach of the co created results. And this is likely to be a composite indicator covering scientific, economic, societal policy aspects, probably taking on board the composite indicators also uh, that are part of the other key impact pathways, but that's to be seen. Uh, but over time, we should be able to tell a very interesting story. And here we have sort of open laboratory. Uh, where we are able to control more of the variables than we might normally be able to do. And perhaps say certain kinds of co-creation activities uh, with certain kinds uh, of actors, uh, either end users or citizens, uh, are more or less likely to be taken up by society. Of course, this is more than 10 years away really, uh, but I think we have here a strong uh, monitoring mechanism. Uh, and uh, in about 10 years time, I hope that we have a lot of data and evidence uh, that will be uh, useful probably in two framework programs and other programs uh, after that. So we can also look at RRI in the, in the Horizon 20 and 2020 and Horizon Europe work programs. You can see here the figures that you saw before, but we've supplemented it with a screening uh, of the draft work programs in Horizon Europe. Uh, now, the first figure in green is excluding the era part, so it's excluding the part that, roughly speaking, takes on board the swaps uh, actions but does some other things as well basically supporting the European research area. Uh, the second one includes the European research area. Uh, of course, this, this is the draft pre-publication uh, work programs and it doesn't include the missions. I would expect the missions would change things uh, a little bit, uh, but we can see here that there's 24 mentions of responsible research and innovation in full and abbreviation uh, across Horizon Europe, um, which is not bad. It's definitely higher than the 10 we started with uh, at the start of Horizon 2020, uh, but there's 11 topics. So we, we already seen an improvement there based on the 2016, 2017 work program. Um, and if we look at including the era part as well, uh, you can see that there's quite a lot of mentions uh, of RRI 
uh, and quite a lot of RI topics. Of course, if we include SWOFs in there, uh, which is not included in the Horizon 2020 figures, uh, the, it's totally different, of course, but uh, I, that's not the argument I'm trying to make. Uh, I'm just trying to show that there is an attention here and it's, it's across the program uh, as a whole. Now, if you look at the different topics, um, some colleagues have been involved in this uh, and they've calculated that <clears throat> close to 30% of the topics um, are requesting or suggesting some form of societal engagement. Now, this is quite uh, encouraging, I would say. Um, so cluster six uh, on food, 62% um, of the project request or suggest societal engagement. I mean, this is, this is really a very high number. Um, you can see lower figures for some of them, but you know, again, uh, apart from cluster four, which I think takes on board parts uh, of Horizon 2020, where there was less attention, this is uh, quite an encouraging beginning to the program. In terms of the projects and impacts, uh, it's evidently too early. There's no projects, there's no impacts at this stage. Um, this is something uh, for someone else to present at some later point in time. So to summarise, I don't know how I'm doing for time, hopefully kept to it reasonably well. Um, the references to RRI, <laughs> ah, thank you. Uh, the references to RRI limited in Horizon 2020, um, the legal text that is, uh, the starting point for mainstreaming was very low but increased over time. Uh, there's now a very large number of projects engaging society uh, and RRI is becoming a self-standing approach that's recognised uh, by the expert evaluators. Uh, Horizon Europe uh, intends to build on the lessons learned of RRI and also the other, all the other uh, research and innovation that took place. Uh, the references in the regulation in the specific programme mean that it's operationalised and mainstreamed uh, in the programme. Uh, and SWAFs was a significant uh, investment in knowledge and capacities and these really need to be leveraged across the program and the disappearance of the SWAFs part um, need not uh, be a hindrance uh, if uh, we can ensure that the expertise that's been built up uh, and the organisations that are able to do this could really bring their experience to bear across the different parts of the program. Moving forwards, uh, the era part will focus increasingly on things that, that have sort of hindered uh, maybe the uptake of RRI in, in the framework program, um, such as developing uh, RRI friendly governance in institutional territorial levels. Uh, I think it's difficult to have a framework program um, which is uh, really making efforts in certain directions if the member state or regional levels uh, have not, are not really in line with this. And I think we're going to see a lot more uh, effort uh, over the coming years to change the way that the institutions and the city institutions uh, are acting um, in Europe as a whole. Uh, there'll be work to update uh, research assessment, uh, so opening this up to much more uh, than the impact factors uh, in publications and things like this, um, and developing training on open and responsible research uh, in research careers. And, and when, the, when the work programmes are published, I think you'll find in the era part that uh, there are key strategic uh, portfolios of projects that we intend to put in place, which really support the era to, to up its game uh, in terms of responsibility and openness but also the other parts of the framework program so i'll come to an end here thank you very much for listening i hope that's been interesting and a, a good place to start uh, the discussions so thank you uh, Lyndon, for your presentation uh, yeah we can give him a hand uh, via the buttons i will do it myself as well um yeah okay thank you also for switching off your um, your uh, your powerpoint for those who are interested you, you you can share your screen now because then also for linden it's a, a little bit more friendly to talk to people instead of a black screen uh by the way this um session is recorded so in case you don't want to be recorded you should of course uh, not turn on your camera um during your talk uh i received already several questions in the chat uh, so i will try to uh, uh, bring some of these questions together in the discussion with you um i don't mind i hope you don't mind that i personally uh, would like to start with a more open question by zooming out a little bit because your 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 presentation was focusing a lot on the operationalization of responsible innovation in, in, in Horizon 2020 and then the Horizon Europe lessons learned. But uh, uh, this is all happening in a political climate uh, within Europe. 
uh, in which on the one hand we can argue that um, a response to innovation is stimulated or can be seen as something that, that should be stimulated if you look at the corona crisis and the pool for collaboration, open science, all these type of things. So there are huge opportunities for resp more responsible types of innovation. And at the same time, you see also a threat, I would say, uh, within the European community. If you look at, for instance, Hungary as a country that uh, is not willing to ratify uh, the Istanbul uh, Convention on Violence uh, Against Women. So then, as a, as a European citizen, you wonder, what does a key like gender mean if particular countries within our community um, uh, for instance can can refuse uh, ratification of these type of conventions so can you reflect a little bit before we zoom in on the on the operational questions again on what is the the, the political climate in which this evaluation of response to innovation how how the political climate informed a response to innovation and also reflects back on it. Hmm. Um, <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's definitely zooming out, um, but it's a very good question as well. I mean, um, in terms of the context, I think you've seen there's been something of a shift, not just in Horizon Europe, but uh, more widely in the European Commission's policy in terms of uh, co creation um, and this attempt uh, to uh, launch debates uh, with society you see this with the conference of the future of europe you see this with the european green deal call uh, the, the green deal uh, itself uh, there's i think there's awareness that uh, more and more we need to bring uh, society uh, with us um, in terms of rri i think the the emphasis has shifted somewhat since the, not in the ways that i've seen it being commented on um, in the academic literature in terms of uh, this move from a very holistic approach of, of channeling um, efforts and, and directing research in socially uh, advantageous uh, directions and towards uh, the dimensions which as i said i don't consider that's it's not quite uh, in the way that it's been portrayed the dimensions are just an area to focus on but more in this idea that there's a lot that we can bring from the rest of society into the processes into policy making processes uh, into research and innovation processes uh, so really trying to leverage the societal capabilities uh, that are out there and i think this is this is something that you see not just in in this program but uh, elsewhere there's something going on uh, more widely politically uh, of course the coronavirus crisis <coughs> uh, has thrown into into stark light the importance uh, of science society uh, relations um, i have to say having looked at some of the eurobarometers that have been uh, some of the uh, barometers that have been uh, launched on this in different countries, it's, it seems to get a very mixed picture. You know, we see in some countries uh, that uh, support for science and innovation and scientists particularly has increased hugely, and in other countries it's declined. A lot of this seems to have to do with uh, at what point of the of the crisis and the pandemic uh, the waves, um, the, the barometers have taken place. And we have a Eurobarometer which should have uh, something to report at a European level in the next month or two. Uh, and I think that this will be uh, this will be an input uh, in terms of of how Europe works together. Uh, I can't comment on the gender equality aspect, particularly in Hungary. I don't know anything about it. Um, of course, there are projects focused on gender equality uh, with Hungarian beneficiaries, and I'm sure that they're doing uh, excellent work there. I mean, Europe tends to work by consensus on the whole. Um, you know, it's it's the way to avoid big permanent bust ups. Um, so. Um, Hopefully, when you work by consensus, you're able to, to eventually arrive uh, at a situation where you can all move forward in the right way. The, the discussions I've, been I've heard about in terms of the European research area have not been uh, quite as you've said. There's been some areas of disagreement, but on the whole, I think there's a, a consensus, more or less, uh, on the need to update uh, research assessment and uh, research careers and, and things like this. So I'm not sure if that really answered your question, zooming out enough. but. Um, yeah, uh, uh, it is good that we that we frame uh, the discussion that we have about uh, moving forward with response to innovation from this political perspective, I would say, but it's at least helpful to to hear how you look at it. Um, 
again, I received several questions, so I try to bring them together. If people, so I try to reframe these questions. Also, if you, you think that I do not represent your question well, please jump in, of course. Um, maybe it's, it's good uh, to start with a question raised by Anne Luber from the University, of, uh, Free University in Amsterdam. Uh, because you see that if you look at responsible innovation uh, as a concept or as a label, which was present in the uh, uh, Horizon 2020 program, that it is uh, translated also in your presentation to um, indicators of responsible innovation, like mm -hmm. public engagement, uh, the keys and that sort of things. And then in the new framework program, um, responsible innovation as a label seemed to be removed and replaced by other labels or maybe not even labels but other concepts and her question was um was there according to you any benefit of having a label responsible innovation in horizon 2020 and if that is the case uh, what do we miss if we do not extend the use of this label in the new framework program <clears throat> Well, that's a that's a good question as well. Um, I, I wouldn't agree that uh, the labels disappeared in the next framework program. Um, maybe there was a particularly successful communication effort at the start of Horizon 2020. Uh, but if you look at the legal texts, at least uh, RRI is still present. Um, but it's not a cross-cutting issue. It's not something that gets mainstreamed in its kind of uh, as a, as a policy in itself. It's you know the way that I've described it has become operationalized now. Um, I think the label was useful. I think it, it created, it helped create a community, a uh, community that often disagreed with the way that the European Commission was putting forward its its way of doing responsible research and innovation, but it did provide a community, uh, a term to coalesce around. Um, and I think uh, having heard discussions with member states, you know, this is something that they appreciated. RRI is uh, part of the RRI policy landscape. It's something that's appreciated. Uh, it's seen as something of a European uh, success story in this uh, respect. Um, many of the projects working in science driven for society, uh, they've been uh, bringing this term and, and discussing it uh, with other actors, for instance, in, in South Africa, in Japan, and China, and, and elsewhere. Uh, and the term, having a term, is a useful thing. Um, what, do, would, what might be lost uh, in terms of the focus on co creation uh, in Horizon Europe? Well, I'm not sure it's, it's necessarily lost so long as. RRI is also there because RRI is the body of knowledge and practice which, which should underpin this. Uh, it's a bit like uh, the citizen science policy uh, that we've been developing the last few years. You will remember 2018, uh, there was a big push to promote citizen science. It sort of came a bit out of the blue. Um, suddenly it's a big part of science within for society. Uh, this is of course on the back of the open science, uh, the three O's policy, which didn't really fully get implemented until Horizon Europe. But the idea of the citizen science uh, policy was that it built on the principles of responsible research and innovation. It wasn't something that was in competition with it or or ignoring this. We, we wanted to see citizen science uh, that developed on uh, on these dimensions, but also on on the practice of, of bringing different parts of society together. Hence, researchers and citizens working together alongside other quadruple helix actors. Often, not just having citizen scientists doing their own thing, which is great, but that's not what we're here about. You know, we want having a science society approach. So it's not difficult to say, this is a, it's, a, uh, it's a bit counterfactual to say what we might lose. I don't agree that RRI has disappeared in the next framework program. But it's up to people like you and all of the organizations you've been involved with to, to either use the term if you think useful uh, or to use the language that's being looked for in the work programs where you can translate it. Uh, because the term is not the important thing, it's the content and the practices, uh, in my opinion, uh, that are. Uh, but of course, this term helps coalesce people. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm a philosopher by training and, and then, then one of the first lessons is always that, that words do matter because they frame a particular reality and some of the things are falling out of it and some of the things are included. Until now, responsible innovation included then the dimensions or the keys and uh, the impression that is also one of the other questions is that, that it is a little bit translated in terms of public engagement which is not necessarily ethical for instance to give an example mm. and seems to be replaced or uh, uh, bring in more focus to say it more positive 
by open science and co-creation. So can we then say that the legislation of responsible innovation is that it continues in terms of open science and, and co-creation? Is that, that a little bit how we can con conceive the legislation of the, the whole debate uh, on responsible innovation in, in Horizon 2020? Not, not quite, I don't think, uh, because, you know, open science uh, is not quite the same as RRI and terms are important, but we also need to be uh, flexible uh, sure. when it allows us to achieve certain things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, RRI, you, you, you may not see that many keywords saying, you know, topics or, or work programs that mention RRI, though I've already mentioned that it's not, you know, it's not the picture that some people take it to be. You, you may find this translated in terms of quadruple helix yeah. or co-design or uh, broad debate you know there's, there's lots of different ways that you can understand responsible research and innovation is being taken up uh, in the next uh, framework program societal engagement as well I, I agree that you know the ethical elements um, are not have not really been focused on so much in the uh, open science uh, agenda but I, I'd say that there's something of a cross mutual cross fertilization here because open science uh, in Horizon 2020 was more about publications and data. Um, we had the Open Science Policy Platform, which uh, sort of extended the notion of open science uh, as a sort of discussion point. Uh, and now we see much more uh, <clears throat> encompassing approach. Uh, and it's all about collaborative work across uh, different actors and things like this. So is something being lost? Uh, I hope not. Um, but, you know, it's probably a bit inevitable as well. As you move on, uh, it's, you gain so hopefully we gain more than we lose let's put it that way sure sure and, th and there th i can imagine that you also have your own agenda and that you want to uh, take the opportunity to bring in new focus points uh, in your new fr framework program but um, it is also good to see what then is taken over or what continues and what is then added in in a way uh, because we also know that that indeed the change of language or the change of conceptuality also have all kinds of implicit um, uh, uh, consequences. One of the other questions, uh, maybe to introduce that other question a little bit. So uh, within the um, uh, uh, New Horizon project, we, we, one of the biggest efforts uh, in my view was a diagnosis of the uptake of responsible innovation throughout the framework program. Uh, Robert Brown added this, the reference to this article in Science Magazines in the, in the chat for those who are interested. Um, regarding the, the diagnosis, your figures seem to be a little bit different than the ones that, that we mm -hmm. provided in our, but that's maybe not the, the, the topic that we should discuss now. But the, the issue is that one of the things that we found was that as, especially at the level of the work program, and the inclusion of responsible innovation in the work program level uh, was lacking in the in 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 uh, horizon 2020 so one of the questions of the colleagues here in the chat is if we now move to horizon europe is it then the case that that uh, these things like open open science and public engagement citizen citizen engagement are really uh, implemented at the program level or the work program level of all the program lines um, yes, uh, I showed the slide which showed that uh, in the clusters, at least, overall between all of them, we expect 27% uh, of the topics to encourage or mandate uh, applicants to engage uh, citizens or society in one way or another. So it is at the level of the work programs. But going back to Horizon 2020, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with you, actually. The diagnosis, is, I think, is correct. Uh, I mean, I can't dispute the, uh, the evidence that you've got, but I have my own inter interpretation of it, of course. Uh, and, you know, in the early work programs, I think it was very, very thin indeed. Uh, then, because of efforts like yours, uh, particularly yours, but uh, there's other projects as well, uh, and also those of us in the Commission who've been working on this, we've seen over time an increase in attention to uh, the concept uh, and to the practices. Uh, and I think this uh, th this is something to do with the latency. There's a latency effect here. You launch a program in 2014, 2015, there's next to no awareness whatsoever, I think. You know, this is a concept which is, you know, no one's been working on. Um, and then you get to 2016, 2017, uh, the work program comes out quite quickly uh, after the previous one, probably after delays, and just like we're seeing now. Um, and, you know, barely any projects have begun. 
So it's still the awareness is very low, but now we're reaching a point where the vast majority of the projects uh, have started. Uh, and every year in Horizon 2020, there's, there's bigger amounts of funding put forward for the different parts, generally speaking. Uh, and Science Within Four Societies increased, I don't know, from about 66 to 80, let's say, uh, over the course of the programme every year. So we start to reach a critical mass and we start to see the effects of this, uh, this latency uh, dissolve a little bit. But I'd say that the, the, um, the awareness of the concept is going to continue increasing um, as the as the projects complete and you know we haven't even we haven't even seen the start of some of the projects in horizon 2020 of course if horizon europe sees a big decrease in attention then there'll become a point at which the you know this uh, attention and awareness levels off and eventually declines but i don't think that's the case what we're trying to put in place in horizon europe despite uh, using let's say using open science as a vehicle but they also present huge opportunities uh, is to try and build on what's already been done um, I, I do wonder if science within course society had been continued in some way, uh, whether people would have the same impression that RRI is, is on the decline. Um, I'm not sure that they would. I think they would say, actually, we have a stronger basis for moving forward in the next framework programme. So the question is about SWOFs. Um, I'm not the only one to, uh, to have some misgivings uh, about this, but I think the argument that we explode the community somewhat and we start to make use of these huge investments that have been made uh, that we start to see the benefits more. Uh, you know, we are facing multiple crises. Um, you know, I'm not talking about the pandemic, the climate change, for instance. We really need to see the tools of doing research and innovation better put into action. And I think there's a time and a place always for theoretical and other kinds of uh, development. But we, I think more and more it's, it's putting this into action uh, in applied areas, I, I guess, uh, to try and make the most of what we're doing. Because we really have to sort of rally around these particular uh, missions and other things over the coming years. Yeah, yeah. One of the the, the criticisms that 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 uh, that I remember is that even within the SWAF program, we were not able to leave the room of the faculties of social sciences, sciences and humanities. We we remained also mainly within our own field of social scientific research, while René von Schomburg, for instance, for instance, always argues. Uh, Horizon Europe provides huge amounts of opportunities to connect really interdisciplinary with other fields of research and with the and with the beta scientists, so to speak. And if you look at it from a de that perspective, then maybe response to innovation is not that important as a label, but it provides a huge amount of opportunities to actually coll collaborate with these others, uh, other groups to uh, achieve responsibility. So that is also a little bit perspective uh, shift of uh, shift of perspective that we might consider as, as uh, social scienti scientists. Um, one question that was raised also, uh, I, I'm curious to hear your, your viewpoint on this, is of course the relation between citizen involvement, citizen engagement and the SDGs. Huh? So, so uh, it, already in the previous framework program, we had a connection between response innovation and the SDGs, uh, for instance, in the RING project. But um, how does this relate uh, responsibility and SDGs in, the, uh, in uh, Horizon Europe? And then more in particular, it might be the case, that's also funny, it might be the case that public engagement um, has a tension uh, with the uh, needs or requirements or the interest of future generations if it comes to global warming, for instance. So, that's a little bit the problem with with citizen uh, engagement, that it sounds very friendly and it sounds very responsible, uh, but there are fundamental tensions between current and future generations if it comes to um, uh, responsibility in this regard. Can you re reflect a little bit on that? <laughs> uh, I can try. Uh, maybe I split that into two. I mean, <clears throat> the citizen involvement can be in different ways. Uh, I think the Green Deal call was uh, was an interesting set of, uh, of of topics centered around the Green Deal. Uh, huge amounts of interest uh, expressed in this, uh, and there was a lot of collaboration across different commission services, uh, DG Research and the other DGs to to put these topic texts together. Uh, I mean, citizen involvement was seen in lots of different ways. Uh, I mean, we focused on part of the Open Science Unit. I mean, our focus has been on the co-creation more or less on the citizen science aspects. Even this breaks down into a lot more than that. We take a very broad approach to this uh, from analyzing data, collecting data, developing uh, methodologies, publishing, uh, advocating on behalf of it. 
but in the Green Deal call, you also see things about working with schools, uh, working with teachers, working with public authorities, uh, trying to reach everyday people to find out their concerns, to work with communities, to work on mitigation efforts and things like this, uh, and to try to, to trigger behavioural changes uh, through involvement or through uh, engagement activities. So, you know, I think that citizen engagement is an important component that's been overlooked. It's not the only story. It should never be the only story. That's definitely not the case. Uh, the reason I think the, the emphasis has been put on this is, one, that uh, it's important to involve society because of what society can bring to the process, uh, as I've said. Um, and the other one is that we're not going to get there uh, if we don't, you know, science is acting alone and, and producing papers and innovations uh, are being produced, which really don't work. We really need uh, to have everyone on board. Uh, I think an illustration of, of the breadth of where the different areas could be for the citizen engagement, I think this is part of the question, was a conference that we held under the German presidency last year. It was called CSSDG, and it was basically looking at how citizen science can work towards and support the sustainable development goals. And as part of this, they produced a declaration, uh, which I think summed up very succinctly uh, how and why um, citizen science can play a part. And at the moment, it's really not uh, playing the part that it should do. And if you look at the Green Deal call, uh, the most heavily oversubscribed parts uh, topics were those on citizen engagement, massively oversubscribed. I think it shows that there's a real lack uh, at other levels uh, for these kinds of activities. Uh, in terms of the public engagement conflict, you know, conflicting uh, with future needs, uh, well, public engagement is obviously in vogue. You know, uh, I've said that it's part of this shift. We're speaking the language that uh, politicians like to hear right now. I think we should make the most of it. Uh, but my feeling is that you know this isn't this isn't something that uh, should be done uh, just to tick a box. You know, the idea is to change hearts and minds somewhat, you know, and to learn. And not just it's not just about scientific literacy. It's about science society literacy. It's about scientists also understanding their role within society, innovators equally, uh, and trying to come to a sense of consensus. And of course, this conflicts very much with what we see in terms of the very polarized views uh, that we find on on social media and reported on the news. Um, I'm not sure whether society is quite as divided uh, on these societal issues as is made out. I, I sometimes get the feeling that you know you look on Twitter uh, and everyone's got one view, which is one extreme or the other. I'm not sure it's really like that in real life. Of course, there are certain elections where you do find uh, things are very polarized, but um, I'm not sure it's quite as bad as that. I would hope that by encouraging public engagement actions, we, we break down the differences. And even if people don't agree with the courses of action, they understand why they need to be taken and they go along with them. You know, and, and Children and uh, youth are one of the, the main groups that are really being targeted for being involved in, in actions, particularly around sustainability for obvious reasons. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we move on with another question by uh, Claudia Cononello. Um, that is a question that is also one of the things that I experience in my institution. Um, what do you think that the role of the of the uh, Horizon Europe is in the institutional uh, institutionalization of responsible innovation at an institutional level, for instance, a research institutional level. For instance, my university, Wageningen University, uh, is, 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 is calling themselves, or we are a green university. So, so my board of directors says, we, we are already responsible because we do everything we do is, is um, a research for society. While we argue now that is not really the case, that if that because there is also indeed, as you indicated, a process dimension of of gender equality in, engagement, all these type of things. So there are also vested interests within institutions, like a research institution, that is hindering the adoption and the further development and implementation of responsible innovation. Do you see and how? If yes, how do you see a role of? Um, um, uh, of the of the program, the new framework program for this. Um, yes, and I can also mention beyond the program. Um, I mean, in Horizon 2020, we piloted this concept of institutional changes towards responsible research and innovation. Uh, as I said, this is one of the ways that we really see that we can create impact. I think this is something that we need to scale up, we need to provide the support. Um, there's of course uh, always opposition to doing things differently. Uh, you find this everywhere. Um, in the next program, I, don't, I mean, this is for my colleagues to, to talk about more, but they're not here. Uh, but from the gender equality side, uh, before long, it's going to be mandatory for research organizations to have a gender equality plan. 
Um, it's not coming in this year, but it comes in from next year. Um, yeah, so the, this, this is the programme saying, if you don't have a gender equality plan, that you may have trouble being funded for your activities. And you know, this is a very strong uh, lever to pull. You, this is not impossible to rule out in the next framework programme uh, for concepts around RRI, because uh, RRI has been following in the footsteps of gender equality plans. Uh, you know, I remember coming into the unit and seeing what had been done in uh, the gender equality plans and thinking, you know, these people are, are really, uh, they really set the path of, of, you know, looking at how we can do this. It's different for RRI than gender equality, but it's uh, something we can learn from. So I wouldn't rule that out. Um, in terms of uh, another, another set of funding, which I haven't mentioned, uh, it's the University Alliances. There's this university uh, transformation agenda, uh, and we've had a role to play in, in, in trying to influence this. Uh, and uh, again, I'm not the person responsible for this, but uh, we've been keeping a close eye on it. And one of the things we've pushed uh, is that there is a focus in the modules. There's different transformation modules that universities can work on together to create uni European universities. There's one on uh, research working with industry more. There's one uh, with uh, universities working with knowledge actors. I would say that's RRI, it's quadruple helix actors, basically. Uh, and there's a module on open science. Um, so although I'm not sure if we find the term of responsible research and innovation in the European universities agenda, uh, probably not. I think what you're finding is a strong hint there uh, that the body of knowledge that's been built up through SWOFs on the institutional changes is going to be needed to do these university uh, transformation modules well. Um, and I have the feeling that some of the U European University Alliances are likely to do this very well. They have good experience. They seem to have uh, quite uh, deep plans for this and others, maybe not. So uh, I, I think this is another area um, that should be uh, important in the years to come. Um, I haven't mentioned the European Research Area in Horizon Europe. We will continue the work there. But in the policy area, you know, the framework program is like a catalyst. But it's not going to work very well as a catalyst if the outside world is not in line with the way that it wants to do things. And that's why there's going to be uh, work on a pact, uh, which will go, uh, I think it's going to be a recommendation to the council to have a European pact on research and innovation, uh, which will put the focus uh, not necessarily on responsible research and innovation per se, using the term, but again, on many of the aspects uh, that are being looked at in terms of uh, attention to ethics, attention to engagement, uh, looking at uh, research assessment in a much more broad manner uh, to reward uh, teaching and, and these kinds of things. So I think there's a lot that the framework program can do. Um, but of course, it's the, I think the member states really, if we want to look at the, the entire research system as a whole, uh, it's the career system, it's the assessment system. This is the area that's that probably the hardest uh, nut to crack and, and the one where the attention is going to increasingly be put, I think, in the, in the coming years. Thank you. So one of the, the follow-up questions that was raised, so, so we do understand, of course, that, that this is a, in the European community, a dynamic process in which concepts and frames come up, um, sometimes have to be adjusted uh, to bring a new focus point, but there is a fundamental risk involved also that things are watering down. So for instance, we talk about responsible innovation and already in your presentation, you measured it as an indicator of this responsibility, public engagement, which mm -hmm. is already, of course, narrowing down the scope. And now we talk about uh, co-creation and open innovation, and these type of concepts are stemming or originating from the private sector, for instance, um, while responsible innovation primarily was oriented on the public uh, research and innovation. So, is there not a risk that by taking advantage of dy this dynamics, and we all understand, but that there is also a risk of watering down uh, the, the conceptuality that we had in mind as a political union with responsible innovation, science for society and science with society? And if you agree that th there is at least a risk, how can we prevent this within the new uh, uh, framework program? <laughs> Well, I think I think you're right. There is a risk. You know, the, what we're doing is something a, a bit different in Horizon Europe. Um, you know, there is the potential that uh, we take the foot off the accelerator in swaps, uh, and it, you know, the slack is not picked up in the other parts of the program, or we haven't made, we haven't created the openings 
sufficiently for, for the good ideas and applicants and the experience to be taken up. Uh, but as I said, I think you know, we've created mechanisms by which uh, we facilitate this. Um, I don't, you know, it can't be guaranteed, it cannot be guaranteed, but one of the ways that you can uh, help ensure that it doesn't slacken off is to try and work uh, as a community, but also individually, uh, to be involved uh, in the different kinds uh, of actions that we see in the framework program. As I'm just talking about the framework program here, I don't know about uh, the other parts. But one of the facilities we put um, <clears throat> at, a, at your disposal uh, on the participant portal is um, a topic search that allows you to find topics according to societal engagement. I know that you say societal engagement is not IRI. I completely agree it's not only IRI. Um, but the way that you know your concepts are, are malleable to some extent and as, as, a, as I tried to uh, make the point we can bring co-design uh, and ethics fairly close they're not the same but it's an opening uh, and I think it's a question of finding these openings uh, and bringing your expertise in there that's that's really the way I'd put it um, two years ago I gave a very similar present uh, not, not similar presentation but a similar message um, with the, the nucleus and RRI practice projects um, and I think that the picture then was a lot uh, was a lot less rosy. Now I think there's, there's a big possibility. Uh, we make clear in the program guide uh, and in the guide, this is guidance that's going to be used by the expert evaluators and the applicants. Uh, and we provide references to key RRI resources. Um, not all of them, but uh, certainly through these key ones, you will have access to all of the others, I'm sure. Um, and we create, a, we, we've redefined excellence in a way, you could say that. Uh, to really force applicants to think about how they involve society. Now, responsibility is all about society. So although societal engagement isn't responsibility, uh, you really cannot have responsibility when you're not thinking about societal engagement, I don't think. So uh, I think the onus is a little bit to adapt and be flexible with the concepts. Uh, that's all I can say at this stage. We have an ex post evaluation of, uh, of Horizon 2020. SWOT will be part of this. Uh, we will try to answer the questions uh, the contractors as well. Is it been too soon uh, to take the foot off the accelerator, or is, has it worked? You know, have have we ended up yeah. uh, doing doing this at the right right moment to create these yeah. impacts? So, but you, you, okay, but to follow up on this, um, there is the risk of watering down, and there is also a risk that that if in the new framework program, um, let's say the, the the there are opportunities for collaboration between social scientists and, and natural scientists on various societal challenges. Uh, there is also a risk that, that these natural scientists, that is at least my experience as well, are not really in need of the social scientists. So that they say, okay, this citizen engagement, we can do it ourselves. And that there's a sort of, we, we, we hire an, an, a communication group to, to, take, to, to, to take the lead in this. Uh, and then you don't take advantage of the opportunity that you intentionally want to, to provide to, to collaborate. And for instance, in the Netherlands, where I come from, we have particular calls by the Dutch Research Council in which they call for explicit beta, gamma, alpha integration of research proposals. Is that, is that, are, there, are there particular strategies that you have in mind to, to make sure that these silos between social and natural mm -hmm. sciences, for instance, are really bridged in the, in the Euro, uh, uh, Horizon um, Europe uh, Framework Program? Uh, it's my understanding that there's also part of the uh, proposal form, I'm not sure if this is new, um, where, where interdisciplinary and SSH considerations have to also be explained um, in the same way as you do with, uh, with engagement activities. Uh, is this strong enough? I don't know. I'm sure my colleagues uh, working on SSH matters I uh, have, have quite a few tricks up their sleeve. Uh, I mean, my, my feeling, this is my personal feeling, is that you don't need to have SSH, you don't need to have RRI, you don't need to have societal engagement in every single project at all. But what you want is you want the right inputs at some stage in this chain of different projects and policies. Uh, and in some parts of the programme, you'll want to see a lot more than in others. And almost certainly, you don't want to see a complete lack in any one part either. So um, I don't know what we can do in terms of SSH. I think it's uh, part of the picture is, is the proposal evaluation and making sure that the experts understand uh, the use for this. But it's not just about having um, someone there for dissemination. Uh, you know, it shouldn't, we need to do, just as we need to do public engagement and co-creation and RRI well with quality, uh, you know, SSH involvement should be done well as well. And having been involved in research projects where you have different disciplines together, I know that this is not easy. 
And in fact, the closer the disciplines are together, uh, the more they disagree about you know technicalities and methods and things like this. So uh, it's it's not an easy thing. Um, science has developed you know this kind of silo approach for good reasons for for decades, uh, but now we find that it's starting to hinder how we do things, and we we need to break this down. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure I can say much more than that. Uh, this is perhaps a research project, and um, probably there's many already. But uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, at least it is um encouraging i think for us also as a community that is attending a, a, a meeting like this that you are aware of the also of the concerns that of course some of the the researchers in this this social scientific background have in this regard and that you are also actively uh, evaluating uh, the, the policies in, in, in order to improve uh, what we what we together want to achieve um the time is up, so I would like to thank you, um, uh, uh, Lyndon Farrell, again for, for his uh, insightful presentation from the perspective of uh, the policy. Uh, I would like to also thank the, the contributors to the discussion, also from the another perspective, sometimes more the, 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 the executives that are doing the, the research themselves, uh, for engaging in this discussion. I really appreciated uh, the openness of your um, answers also and, uh, and the way you, um, uh, you helped us to understand what is going on. Um, I hope uh, for, the, uh, for the rest of the audience, I hope that you enjoyed the meeting. There will be a recording uh, uh, that you can uh, see later on. Uh, there are many more uh, sessions of the final conference of the New Horizon project. So if you are interested in, uh, in what we are doing, what we have achieved, uh, and the other dissemination of other findings, uh, I think the best way to uh, get in touch with us is by, by visiting our website and then see also the programs there because we have uh, all kinds of small sessions there where you can pick the best, uh, the best session that you want to attend and then uh, digest all the material in a good way. Thanks again and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent.